Professor Galab of the Arab Republic of Egypt declared that the human race during the Paleolithic era, that is the Stone Age, was more or less homogeneous and Caucasian, and that Negroes only began to appear much, much later. A Negro culture, he claimed, did not appear prior to the Neolithic, that is the age of agriculture. Professor De Bono of Malta spoke of a race of pyramid builders coming into Egypt, a race with libico-asiatic affinities, without even deeming it necessary to show where on this arc stands the proto-pyramid that this race constructed before it migrated to Africa. Several participants, finding it difficult to demolish the up, decided instead to demolish all talk about race. Professor Saab Soderberg of Sweden, while demonstrating that the majority of Neolithic cultures in the Nile Valley belong to techno-complex of Saharan and Sudanic cultures, said the concept of race was outmoded and should now be abandoned. Now they, now they have to accept that Africans are at the root of things. We don't let us talk anymore about race. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Barkuta of France, insisting that there was no way to tell how many the Egyptians were white and how many were black, felt the evidence nevertheless showed that Egypt at least was African in its way of writing, its culture, and its way of thinking. Well, what more African could you be? If your culture is African, your writing is African, and your thinking is African, how are you going to be white and black? I mean, obviously the whites must have trickled in. They couldn't con be the dominant figure in Egypt and the writing, the thinking, and the culture is African. Yeah. Professor Shinny of Canada said that Herodotus and all the Greeks and Romans who called Egyptians black were merely being subjective like Dr. Diop. Race was not a scientific concept. Professor Mokhtar of the Arab Republic of Egypt said the problem of race was unimportant. I know this Mokhtar guy. He's out of this world. I spoke with him on the telephone with a French interpreter. He made me write to get permission to publish Diop's essay, Origin of the Ancient Egyptians. He made me write a statement saying that um, not all the participants agreed with this thesis. Not all the participants agreed about anything. But I had to put that, this is an Egyptian, you know. This is an Egyptian. Um, Professor Abdullah of the Sudan, after chiding Diop for adopting an Africanist approach to this problem, he told Diop that you can't be Africanist when you're dealing with this problem. Then he went on boldly to assert that the Egyptian language belonged to a family of proto-Semitic languages and that there was abundant evidence to prove it. He had not come to the conference, however, with his abundant evidence. Because Diop asked him, Give, let us have this abundant evidence. He hadn't come with abundant evidence. He left it at home. This, in fact, was one of the remarkable revelations of this international conference. In its final report, UNESCO pointed out, quote, although the preparatory working paper sent out by UNESCO gave particulars of what was desired, not all participants had prepared communications comparable with the painstakingly researched contributions of Professor Sheikh Antibi of Obenga. Who told them not to prepare? They had centuries to prepare their case. At last they met the Africans prepared. The Africans at last had done their homework, and those theses which had once seemed formidable now shook with the fragility of leaves in the new intellectual wind blowing from the continent. I just want to give you some idea of what is really happening. This is not by any means because they're just a few people. It doesn't mean that they're getting their way. They cannot get their way anymore. All over this country, people are getting involved. White students as well are asking. For example, I taught at, I taught at Princeton for three years in the fall. In addition to my Rutgers thing, I taught in the fall black civilization. There were 80-something students. 50 of them were white. Do you know that those students fought to get into the class? That famous actress, what's her name? That young actress, Brooke Shields. Brooke Shields, she was there at the time, and lots of students wanted to get in the same class in which she was in. Sure. But they made a special effort to get into this class. Brooke Shields was not in it. They fought, they, I had to push them out because there were a hundred and something students. I had to actually close the line down at eight or something. So that this kind, there is a an uneasiness 
among these students because they look around the world and they know the, the white American is hated all over the world. And it's not, you, you can't escape because the world is coming smaller and smaller. Planes are all over the place. So you can't walk out there and bare your chest and escape. Somebody is going to get you for what you're doing. And therefore these students are beginning to think again and think again. We still have some very strange people among us. A teacher, and I wouldn't call her name, she's black, in an elementary school in Portland, where I have been recently to try and change the curriculum. Fortunately, her essay has come back to me, and I have a chance to blast it out of the water, which I will. Do you know what she's doing? She's written a monograph, Great Black Leaders, in which she shows the Egyptians are black and the Carthaginians are black and so forth, but in order to sell it to the white people, guess what she's writing? That Although white people had made black people into slaves later, black businessmen in Carthage had made lots of whites into slaves, so that blacks have the comfort of knowing that they're not only descendants of slaves, but slave owners. Th that's how she's playing up to the whites to get the text accepted. And then she says that in ancient times, very white skin or very black skin um, was considered beautiful by different people, but in modern times, um, black people like light tan skin, and white people go in, in on the beaches to get light tan skin suit. So everybody's moving now into one thing. This is a black teacher <laughs> introducing new historical men. What is she trying to do to show the white people around her? She's very balanced, extremely balanced, and screwing up another generation. Fortunately, we have got into the process. I am asked as a consultant to look at all the materials that are being used because they had, these people have been in court over not having black teachers and not introducing black things into the his, history curriculum. So fortunately, some of these things have to come to me for vetting. And that book is not going no place. She has wasted her time. Now this is very important because this is one of the things I did. The first thing I did when I came to America, I asked for authority to go through the library of Douglas. As soon as I gained the authority, I asked for permission to create a white list. And all the books I went to that said that, like for example, is a book I opened it on fairy tales, it said that white people, advanced industrial white people have fairies. But primitive people have animal, animals and demons. They, they have the white, people have the fairies and we have the animals like burra rabbit and burra tortoise, etc. Well, that book went through the window. And I removed systematically from the library masses of books. Of course, you can't do it for all because you'd have to remove all the books. But one at least removed some of the worst criticism. We had a teacher who we got fired. You know what he was telling the students? In Africa, there are people who are as tall as eight feet, and some of them are as small as six inches. <laughs> this, this is in the university. In there. There, are there are Africans who are tall as eight feet and as small as six inches. <laughs> now, let me get to my subject. I had an opportunity, as I say, to meet Diop, and it was a great tragedy that he died because he was arranging for us to study with Leakey and various other people because Diop has links with people all over the world. He had a very broad vision in his work as a scientist, as a politician, as a linguist, as a historian, as an Egyptologist, are all things that are, are extremely valuable. And I strongly advise you to get that book. It is an absolute must because no thinker from the African continent in the present time went as far as Shekanta Diop and he's going to leave a shadow over us for a long time. Now, I want to say something that happened 24 hours before Diop's death. That is one of the most ironic occurrences that I have seen. 24 hours before Diop died, and I only discovered this two weeks ago, Nature 
the magazine Nature, because I wasn't sure when Diop died. I was flying all over the place in February, and they came home one Sunday, and somebody said Diop died, but they didn't say when. And I only learned at a late time that he died on February the 7th. Now, the, on February the 6th, Nature, one of the great scientific magazines of the establishment, published an extraordinary statement by 11 doctors. One of them, Falusi, is a Nigerian. The others are white doctors, mostly from Oxford hematology units. They have shown in a study of what is known as DNA polymorphisms that not only was the first man African, but the first modern man was an African. And that all man, all man, white and Asiatic, spring from a modern African. In other words, what is in dispute has been for a long time they're saying yes okay we accept that man was born in Africa but he came to Europe at the homo erectus stage that is a low level very primitive stage and then he evolved into superior type of man in Europe Caucasian and a superior type of man in Asia and the poor African left back in Africa he just deteriorated until we brought civilization to him the new scientific studies show that the last man the highest level of le evolution that produced modern man, not Homo erectus and all of those. All those were born in Africa. Yes, six types of man were born in Africa. You have the Australopithecus robustus, then the Australopithecus gracile. All of these are developments in brain and intelligence. Then you have Homo erectus. Homo erectus um, leaves and he goes out. Homo habilis is the third. But yet he, those three never left. They weren't developed enough to move in any, any great distances. Then comes Homo erectus. Homo erectus comes out of Africa. He spreads all over Africa. He goes out into Europe. He goes out into Asia and he disappears. Then comes a more advanced type, Neanderthal man. Neanderthal man is an African man. He goes into Europe. He goes into Asia and he spreads out Africa. Then comes the final man, the man with which all of us are white, black or yellow. That is Homo sapiens sapiens. And this study shows that that final man is an African. In other words, all man living on the earth today has an African great, 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 great grandmother and grandfather. And I'm not talking about Lucy and those far blown things. I'm talking about just a hundred thousand years ago. And European man is only now considered to be 50 to 55,000 years old. African man goes back to four and a half million. And when African modern man goes back to 90 to 100,000 years old, European man is 50 to 55. Some Dia puts him at 30,000. But you have this movement because we're talking about Europe. It has now been established that man moved out of Africa, spreading out over various parts of Africa and spreading out because Europe is only 20 miles from Africa at its nearest point. And it was not separated by the Gibraltar states at this point. You could cross by dry land into Europe. So that if the African kept moving and moving and moving in the hunting gathering stage, he spread out into Asia, again not across the sea, but because of land. In some places he just went in boats and he crossed over. Then came an ice age. Half of Europe was covered by ice one mile thick. Some of the Africans were pushed up into Eurasia, an area which you would now call Eurasia, on, on the, uh, somewhere in Russia and that group started to undergo mutation because of thousands of years this is not something that could take a few years or a few generations and it doesn't it cannot happen today because you don't have an ice age in extreme ice conditions